uh, thank you for joining our first virtual workshop for the Robotics Roadmap for Australia. Uh, my name is Sue Kay and uh, I'm a Research Director for Cyber Physical Systems with CSIRO's Data61 and I guess was the lead in putting the first Robotics Roadmap together. Um, just a few housekeeping matters. When you do join our meeting, would you mind uh, just making sure that you're on mute? Uh, mainly because I haven't figured out how I can mute everyone else. So uh, just to avoid too much noise. If you do have questions during the session, then uh, please uh, use the chat function within WebEx. Uh, and we may have some time for some quick questions at the end, but hopefully you'll be able to participate in a range of different ways uh, through today's session. I just have to figure out how to move my slides. There we go. Uh, I'd like to thank all of my co-chairs for this services section of the Robotics Roadmap. Uh, Nathan Kirchner, Nikki Rousseau, Marianne Ballot, uh, Trevor Fitzgibbons, Nicole Hartley and Mary McGeoch. Um, so to give you a bit of background on where we're at, uh, what happened in terms of how the first roadmap came together, I thought we'd go back in history a little bit. Um, so the idea behind putting a robotics roadmap together for Australia was really because uh, I noticed that other countries had one and we didn't. And so I asked around and it seemed that a few people within the robotics community had thought about it at some time and, and I was lucky enough at the time to be working with the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision which is an Australian government funded centre of excellence and I thought well surely that maybe could be one of our roles to show some leadership in the robotics space and put a roadmap together and that's how the first roadmap was born. And we're also very lucky within the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision that one of the people on our advisory board is Professor Henrik Christensen from the University of, uh, University of California, San Diego. And he has been responsible for now three versions of the US Robotics Roadmap. So I had the opportunity to spend a bit of time with him to find out what the US had done in terms of putting their roadmap together and you know, what sort of impact it had managed to have. And by the time they got to a second version of the robotics roadmap in the US, they actually were able to secure more than $100 million worth of funding towards uh, research and development in robotics in the US. And partly that was because they had a really clear line into the US government at the time through a, um, a sort of standing committee. Um, unfortunately, that no longer exists because uh, obviously governments change uh, from time to time. But you know, it seems from, from all reports that the US Robotics Roadmap has had uh, a, a, a good influence on the robotics community over in the US and it seemed like a good thing that Australia should be looking to replicate. And you know, one of the curious things that we found in putting the first roadmap together was that you know, Australia really isn't using uh, robots or automation at the rates that you might expect. Uh, so compared to uh, the US, for example, fewer Australian firms are actually engaged in automation. Um, and the reason that this is important is that in general, Australia's labour productivity has been growing at, growing at a fairly constant rate over the last five years at about 1.8%. But it has to be a lot higher than labour productivity for us to maintain our standard of living. It has to be up at around 2.5%. And the way that you bridge that gap between labour productivity and general productivity is often through the application of technology. In fact, that's one of the easiest ways that you can bridge that gap. So the more that we are adopting new technologies, you know, the easier it is for us to maintain our standard of living. So when I say that Australia isn't using robots as much as some other countries, a standard measure that is often used uh, by the International Federation of Robotics is uh, our robot population density. And as you can see there, Australia's robot population density is 80 robots per 10,000 employees. And you know, the world average is 85, so we're below average. Uh, but when you compare us with the world's number one country in terms of robot population density, which is Korea, uh, they have 710 robots per 10,000 employees. So Australia ranks 23rd, so we're not last, so, so that's good. Uh, but compared to a country like Korea, where we're really not in yeah. the same um, ballpark. And the reason that that's important is that, uh, you know, I mentioned the US Robotics Roadmap. There are many countries around the world that have 
really clear strategies around how they want to implement both robotics and artificial intelligence and are starting to enact those strategies. And uh, China has got the stated ambition to be the world's number one country in terms of robot population density by this year, which would mean that they would be trying to knock Korea off their perch and have more than 710 robots per 10,000 employees. So I have done a back of the envelope calculation at one point and the numbers are truly staggering. If you think about how many robots that actually means being deployed in China, it's more robots than the uh, human population of Australia. And when we talk about robot population density, we're talking about a very specific type of robot and that's industrial robots. So this doesn't count a lot of the other robots that you might find out and about, which we often call service robots, uh, things like your vacuum cleaner robots or robots used in, in education or in um, uh, telehealth. These are just robots that you'd mainly find on the uh, floors of manufacturing plants. So we have a bit of room for improvement said that, one of the very encouraging things is that while Australia might not be using robots as much as we perhaps could, we're living in a time when consumers are actually very expectant about us using robots. In fact, many people think that we are applying robotics far more than we actually are. And thanks to a lot of Hollywood movies, people think that robots are far more advanced than they are in reality. But we're living in a great time to be involved in robotics because 58% of people think that robots will have a positive impact on society. So uh, it's really a very good place to be. And as part of doing the roadmap, you know, we discovered that there are some fantastic Australian companies applying robots in all sorts of different fields um, and in very innovative ways. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of these stories had uh, really been hidden. Uh, and I don't think that uh, the rest of Australia really knows some of the great news stories that we have around robotics in this country. And so the first thing that we uh, looked to do was actually try and do some capability mapping. So all of the red dots on that map of Australia uh, identify companies that are involved in some way, shape or form in robotics. And when I use the term robotics, I'm using that in a very broad sense to capture a lot of robotics related technologies, areas which robots, robotics rely on, but may not actually be robotics in and in of themselves. So you can think of uh, companies that perhaps specialize in computer vision or make sensors that may or may not be applied to robots. All of those things are important in terms of how we have a broader robotics industry. So when we were looking at companies, we were looking for these particular keywords that you see to the right of the picture of Australia and uh, the companies that uh, have been identified are engaged in some of those activities. And what we found was, and we think that this really is uh, quite an underestimate because uh, of the data that we were able to, um, to base it on, is that if we try and describe what the robotics industry in Australia looks like, we think that there are more than a thousand companies currently operating in that broad field of robotics, that they employ more than 50,000 people and that they are worth more than $12 billion in revenue to the Australian economy. Now, the reason that those numbers are important is that you know, typically the Australian Bureau of Statistics is not currently collecting data on our robotics industry. And so if we are to you know, get support from the government, you know, suggest that they change policies to help the robotics industry, then you really need to have a good handle on what exactly the robotics industry is in Australia. And until we did that first roadmap, I think it would be fair to say that we really didn't have a very good handle on what the robotics industry in Australia looked like. And at the moment, this is our best guess. And by virtue of doing the second version of the robot, I'm hoping that we'll get much more robust metrics. And in the future, perhaps, we can hope that the Australian Bureau of Statistics start collecting data that would really let us uh, hone in on, on the value of this sector to the Australian economy. And another reason that that's important is that until a sector is recognised, uh, yeah, it is very hard for the government to know how it can support it. Um, if I'm to give an analogy, there is another sector called the MET sector, which until recently was undefined. That stands for Mining Equipment and Technology Services. So these are companies that supply into the mining value chain. But 
the Australian Bureau of Statistics collected data on them as if they were in completely unrelated fields. So it might consist of engineers, it might be manufacturers, it might be consultants. So when they looked at that more as a, um, a cohesive unit or as a sector in its own right, what they discovered that it is actually one of the powerhouses of um, Australia's export in terms of technology. And I suspect if we were able to get better data on robotics, I would hope that we'd be able to tell a similar story. And so the robotics roadmap for Australia was released in mid 2018. Uh, and it really gave a bit of an overview of what was happening in Australia in different sectors in terms of robotics and what sort of opportunities there might be in the future. Some of the recommendations from the roadmap, and I think there's a total of um, about 18 uh, all up in the roadmap, but in general, we, we, we sort of broadly put them into different areas uh, and had a range of recommendations, both for industry, the education sector, for government, for the research and development sector, and also in terms of um, you know, what might be necessary in terms of changing culture here in Australia to support a, a sustainable robotics industry. So we looked at a number of different things that, that could be done. And I don't think there's anything particularly controversial about those things. Uh, we haven't been successful in, in getting all of the recommendations from the first roadmap um, implemented, but I think we've made a good start. So the purpose of this uh, virtual workshop is to focus on the services sector. And the services sector is a really interesting part of the Australian economy. And I think it's actually probably one of the most difficult sectors uh, to, um, to address in mainly because it is uh, so incredibly broad. So the Australian services sector really dominates the Australian economy. It is actually worth 70% of Australia's gross domestic product. So more than $1,000 billion in terms of output. It employs 11 million people and is responsible for about 20% of Australia's exports. And you can see the range of key activities included in the services sector is vast. It includes transport, logistics, waste yeah. management, so all your financial services, banking, retail, education, construction, utilities, uh, security, property services, social services, uh, you know, maintenance, health, all of those sort of things. There are a number of key technologies that can be applied in this sector. And I think a lot of the opportunities in the services sector are really around addressing some of the issues that Australia will be facing in the future. So, you know, a lot of the demographic shifts that we're experiencing as we get an aging population, how we'll be able to provide many services in the future. All of these things um, are tied up with, with how we could introduce more robotics in this sector. But it's also an interesting area in that in general, um, probably robotics hasn't made many inroads into the services sector as yet, but when it does, it will have significant impact. And that's because of the size of the services sector and its importance to the Australian economy. So we identified a few key robotic technologies for the sector and also what some of the challenges and opportunities were likely to be. But as I said, it really is such a huge area. I think we were only scratching the surface on what some of these opportunities were likely to look like. And just to put that in some perspective, and I apologize, this is a bit of a complicated diagram uh, and not exactly the scale, but the size of those um, circles give you some idea of, of how representative are some of the different sectors. And we define sectors in the same way the Australian Bureau of Statistics does. Uh, but the services sector, as you can see, has a re really outsized, um, uh, is an outsized part of the Australian economy compared to all other mm -hmm. sectors. And it encompasses a range of different areas and the different colours are really representative of how much robotics has made inroads into those sectors. So services is really uh, ripe uh, in terms of opportunity for deployment of robotics. Some of the other sectors like manufacturing, resources, defence, in particular manufacturing, they've had robots for more than 70 years in that sector. In some respects, it's nothing new, although the types of robots that they can deploy are quite different now to the ones that uh, they were using 70 years ago. 
But in the services sector, we've up to date, we've seen very little impact of robotics, and that is actually a huge opportunity in itself. Now, another outcome from the first robotics roadmap was that we found in talking to the different sectors that there really was quite um, a, an interest in finding out how we could transfer some of the knowledge from one sector into the other. And I think, you know, although we always divide things into sectors, so I guess if you're in manufacturing, you're unlikely to turn up at a mining conference. Um, on the other hand, I think we miss a lot of opportunities by not looking for opportunities from different sectors and then applying them to our own. So I can't say that we actually have a solution to this, but one benefit of, of putting information about each of the different sectors in the roadmap is that it does give people a bit of a line of sight of what's happening in other sectors and perhaps open their, their um, it perhaps opens people's minds to the possibilities of how you might apply something that's occurring in another sector into your own sector. Another thing that came from the first robotics roadmap was um, some ideas around the importance of creating technology clusters. Um, in terms of manufacturing, that can have an important role in terms of cus mass customization and reshoring jobs back to Australia. But in general, what has been found in many other parts of the world and in some other sectors within Australia, like the food industry, is that clustering is an important way for an industry to really start to achieve critical mass. And the reason for that is that often clusters uh, really need to be in close proximity. So one that we had a, a good look at was a cluster of um, robotics and technology that has uh, developed in Pittsburgh. It's actually been uh, nurtured in Pittsburgh um, through the Pittsburgh Technology Council for more than, uh, I think, 23 years now. Um, but you can see that a lot of uh, tech companies are very closely located um, in Pittsburgh and that has a number of benefits. Once you start to get to a certain critical mass, then it means that, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for the talent that you develop. And I think at the end of the day, everyone would probably prefer to see that the talent and technologies that we develop here in Australia have opportunities to pursue here in Australia rather than having to go overseas to pursue them. And one way that we can hope that that can happen is if we can encourage the formation of things like these technology clusters, where you get a lot of sharing of information, sharing of human resources, uh, and also um, in close proximity to some of our um, universities and research organisations, so that in general, you just end up with the critical mass that means that people are more likely to base their companies near these clusters, uh, and find a good source of talent. And so after the first robotics roadmap, we now have the development of a Queensland robotics cluster. And that is the first one of these in Australia. We're hoping that there will be more of these clusters forming in different parts of the country. Um, hopefully the Queensland robotics cluster can, I guess, break some new ground in, in how we can make that possible. I think the other challenge that Australia faces is that we are a country that's dominated by small to medium sized enterprises. And I think in that respect, clustering again is very important to make sure that we can uh, maximise opportunities by getting some critical mass so that it's not one, country, one company just on its own trying to make things happen, that there is really a community that's trying to drive things forward. A few other things that happened in the wake of the first robotics roadmap uh, were that uh, we commissioned a study specifically in Queens, around Queensland in terms of what the economic benefits of robotics and autom automation would be for the Queensland economy. And a lot of the results in that um, can be applied to other states. And there was also an alpha beta report that came out um, more specifically around the mining and energy sector around the impact that robotics and automation can have. So there's a lot of important learnings in both of those reports as well. Uh, from the uh, robotics and automation report for Queensland, the main finding was that uh, over the next 10 years, robotics and automation can have a significant impact on our gross state product in Queensland, um, adding an additional $77 billion and also creating uh, more than 700,000 jobs. So 
I mean, I think the message that uh, robots can actually lead to job creation is one that is not um, often heard in our mainstream media, but it is an important message to try and get out. So in the future, jobs are likely to look different, but there's not uh, likely to be less jobs. Um, and how we support people to transition into those new jobs is really going to be critical in terms of one, how people feel about the adoption of robotics and automation, but two, really in um, how our economy will transition. Because everybody else in the world is adopting robotics and automation. It's not as if we have um, actually much choice. We can either adopt new technologies like the rest of the world does, or it will have significant uh, negative consequences for our economy. And I think the bottom line really is that in both artificial intelligence and robotics um, more generally, our opportunity to take up these technologies is really time limited. So one of the things that this economic study found was that there were significant benefits uh, for, to the Queensland economy by adopting robotics and automation, but that those benefits only accrued if we adopted rapidly. And so if we let the opportunity slide and we don't do anything about it for a few years, the opportunity will vanish. A few more of the outcomes of the roadmap. It actually got pretty good uptake across social media. I think it generally raised awareness of robotics. There was the creation of an entity called the Six Wave Alliance uh, with some uh, key people interested in robotics. We're now converting that into something we're calling the Robotics Australia Network. The Queensland Robotics Cluster has gotten started. Uh, it's raised awareness amongst many of our politicians, including Senator Kim Carr, who particularly picked up on that aspect of around the narrative uh, around robotics and job creation. And Australia's chief scientist actually um, identified three key messages that he got from the launch of the roadmap. And that that is that, you know, despite the fact that uh, many people are not attracted to working in Australia's traditional industries, that's actually where a lot of the high tech um, work is happening. These industries are building a lot of Australia's tech capacity. Uh, and obviously we need a more diverse workforce or, or we're missing out on 50% of the talent. Another great outcome from the first robotics roadmap were just some um, you know, fantastic uh, case studies of, of things that Australia has been the first in the world to do uh, and has really, really led development in. And as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, many of these stories are, are not well known. Uh, and in fact, you know, sometimes when people come from overseas, they even wonder why Australia bothers doing robotics at all. I think the truth though, is that Australia has some unique reasons for doing robotics precisely because of um, our geography, because we're a vast continent with only a small population that actually really lends itself to the application of, of robots so that we can service remote areas and so that we don't necessarily have to put people in harm's way to be able to get the work done that we need to get done. So for version two of the roadmap, the, the reasoning behind doing this is as we're developing this new uh, network for robotics in Australia, we want to really want to keep the momentum going. Um, there are a few things in the first roadmap that I was a bit disappointed we, we weren't able to tackle in detail. Uh, one main thing was in actually looking at what are the technologies that we really need to have in five, 10 and 15 year times. And of those technologies, what are the ones that we can uh, pick up off the shelf and what are the ones that Australia really uh, can make a difference and help to develop? I think another reason for doing the second version of the roadmap is around unearthing capability. The first roadmap was a fantastic exercise in actually discovering many of these hidden uh, robotics companies and being able to shine a light on, on their, some of their achievements. And, and I'm hoping that the second version will be able to do the same thing. But ultimately what we want to do is establish a clearly recognised robotic industry here in Australia. Um, and uh, I think that with the Eventbrite invitations, you would have been sent a link to this survey Given that we're unable to do face-to-face -face meetings at this time, uh, we're putting a survey out so that people can um, offer us their viewpoint on different aspects of robotics in Australia, um, which hopefully we can incorporate in the roadmap or take forward in, in other ways. So 
Uh, that's really all the background I wanted to give on the robotics roadmap. Um, and I think I've finished a little ahead of schedule. So we probably have some time for questions before we move on to the next section. And I think uh, perhaps uh, previewing what Nathan is likely to tell you in a few minutes, the way that we're structuring the rest of the workshop will be uh, to encourage engagement around a couple of key questions that we want answered in the roadmap. But I'll just pause there and I'm just looking at the chat. Does anyone have any um, immediate questions or I will hand over to Nathan? Everybody. Okay, I'm going to keep going then everyone, everyone okay. if you change your mind, put something in the chat and I'm very happy to pause and get back to say, so. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. Okay, thanks Nathan. So um, yeah, please um, guide us through the rest of the workshop. Okay, so this is very simple. Um, to start with, I'm sure everyone's well and truly aware that remote working or working over video conference is a little bit different to doing it face to face. So we're going to, uh, going to be going with that. Um, so as you would have already picked up, Sue's just done a fantastic job of setting the scene and giving us an introduction of what's going on. I think to be probably a little bit coarse, things are going very well in Australia and we're achieving a lot of stuff that we could and we should and we can do a lot better of doing a bit better is bringing things together, expanding on and taking some of these opportunities. So there's a couple of things in this presentation that really jumped out at me on how we've got some great opportunities to get into these emergency, emerging markets that are, are local and actually achieve something. Um, I'm actually pretty excited by that, contrary to my monotonic voice. Um, so to move uh, on with that, there are plenty of things we're trying to expand or build on in this forthcoming revision of the roadmap. But perhaps the three key ones that we want to focus on to have discussions about, um, which are going to be introduced by some different co-chairs in a second, and we are going to run separate uh, sessions on. But just to give you an idea now, uh, where are we now as in, in terms of what have we achieved? What major changes do we need to make looking inwards as a community to try and do what it is we do better? That might be change the political landscape. That might be actually just coordinate a bit better. And then the last one is what are the things we need to change? So more of what we, we do actually makes it out there into general use, into the actual sectors, into actual um, industry. So we'll go through each of those in turn. Uh, you'll meet some co-chairs and then we'll uh, probably do the whole collect names and follow on later in individual sessions because unless you've got a better idea of how to do something like this in video conferencing, that seems to be something that's actually going to work. So I will hand over to Mary now uh, to take you on to where are we now, what have we achieved? Thank you, Nathan. Um, so first of all, um, thank you, Sue. Um, yeah, a, a remarkable presentation, remarkable work on version one um, of the roadmap in 2018. And the generation, I think, um, awareness of robotics in general nationwide. So a few things jumped out at me, obviously, um, trying to get us up to a baseline of what some of the um, other uh, countries are doing in the world and some of the economic benefits that I was hearing for the services sector. Fantastic. Um, and that, that should speak volumes to, to people looking to progress this sort of work. So hi everyone, I'm Mary McGeoch. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs for the services workshop for the Australian Robotics Roadmap for Australia version um, 0.2. And, uh, and I think I see this as an opportunity to build on some of the great work in version 0.1 um, to Sue's point about some of the, the areas that she wanted to, to continue work on. So to reiterate, we're holding a series of workshops nationwide to progress the second edition of this roadmap, looking at the impact of robotics and related technologies on the services sector in Australia. Um, we've included for your reference the first edition, so suggest that you, um, you read through it. It's a fantastic read. Another reminder for me is just to um, please contribute to our online survey and we're encouraging ideas. 
as to how robotics can aid in some of our more, more recent crises, such as bushfires and, and COVID-19 that we're all experiencing at the moment. Um, so today I'll be introducing question one, which is where are we now? So through this question, we're seeking to understand what have we achieved as a community? So Sue did outline some of this in, in the roadmap, but I'm interested to hear what we haven't captured or what has happened since that roadmap. So what have we achieved in fragments throughout our communities given the significance and potential for robotics in the services sector? Here we have an opportunity to be inclusive about what's going on at the moment and to better reflect how we're positioned as a baseline in 2020. What areas should, do we think that we should update from version one? So we heard about what um, areas Sue would like to update. What else should we include in version two that perhaps haven't been articulated as, as such as yet? Uh, are we working in universities and laboratories? What joint ventures are there with organizing with organizations generating the economic benefits that Sue spoke about today? So Sue spoke to the size and significance of the service sectors and job creation. Um, we're interested in robotic technology, service robots, um, the economic benefits to Australia, data insights and trends, computer and machine vision, AI deep and machine learning, automation and autonomous systems, just to reiterate Sue's point as well. Um, another facet too that I'm, I'm interested from my background and perspective is the labour shortage, ageing population and productivity to ensure workforce skills. So we talked about job creation in the, the first roadmap. So the goal of this workshop and, and forward is to align ourselves to devise, develop and contribute case studies, recommendations and content as individuals. As um, Nathan said, we've set up a, an online uh, repository for everyone to submit contributions and um, myself included and my fellow co-chairs will circulate these details post the event today. So perhaps um, I look to you to consider preparing a case study for inclusion in this roadmap, approach any one of us at any time. Um, after this call, we will send consolidated feedback and encourage everyone to register to any newsletters, the website and provide further information. So to outline our next question number two, I'm going to throw over to Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. Just unmuting myself. There we go. Good technology handover there. Uh, thank you so much, Mary, and thank you so much, Sue, for setting um, the, the scene so well for you know what we're trying to achieve here um, today and more broadly as this robotics community throughout Australia. Um, I think Mary's given you a very good overview just then of what we're trying to achieve as co-chairs here today, and I'm really privileged to be working with the other co-chairs in this in this service sector around the, the robotics roadmap. Um, it's, as Sue indicated at the start, it's such a broad sector. Um, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming even when we think of it as co-chairs about the number of different service organisations um, that we're trying to address across, across this sector and how robotics can be applied. Um, if I take a step back, because what I'm going to be talking to you about um, in my little segment today is, you know, what do we need to do as a, as, a, as a community or what can we do or what can we do more as a robotics community in this sector? And I, I sort of give you a couple of examples of what we're doing uh, a little bit more close to what my direct involvement is to give you an idea around that. Um, so I'm a, an academic at uh, the University of Queensland um, Business School. Um, and I'm a service researcher. So I'm, I'm, we're looking at how service robots in particular um, are uptaken into a variety of different service sectors. Um, and, you know, so that could be everything from looking at how they're utilised in education through to healthcare, and I do a lot of work in healthcare around robotics in particular, um, through to other areas such as tourism, hospitality, um, retail, et cetera. Um, you know, even in our field of understanding how service robots, and, you know, that's very different service robots and how we define service robots. Um, there's a lot of disparity around that in particular, you know, we're looking at whether they're called service robots, whether they're called social robots, or whether they're called virtually assistive robots, um, all very much speaking to the same thing, that they have that human interface um, with a customer or with, you know, another service provider. Um, but that's just one type of service robot in this whole service landscape that we're operating in. So we have, you know, all of the other types of robots, some in which, you know, um, Sue talked about at the beginning there from talking about, um, inspection robots that are used in utilities to back-end robots that are used in construction areas. 
um, to service uh, to delivery robots that we see being used by Australia Post. Um, probably getting a, quite a work over at the moment in the isolation world that we live in. Um, um, and then obviously the Pepper robots, the really interactive robots that we see in the serv in the service robotics space. So just a broad remit of different types of robots. Um, you know, so even in my field of research and looking at service robots, you know, there's this disparity of how our understanding of what service robots are, their application across service sectors. Um, when we look at our literature to try and understand and add meaning to service robots, we're looking at this from psychology, from management, from marketing, from IT, from engineering. Um, so, you know, the remit is quite broad for us to even as a service robot service uh, robot research community to understand this. Um, so there's still a lot to be done in our own spaces, I'm sure, and I'm sure in the areas that you work in, um, you've got clusters of people that you're maybe working with. Um, but, you know, for us to make a broader impact and for us to have this broader relevance and to be recognised as this robotic industry as what the roadmap is driving towards. I think we need to be looking at different ways in which we might be able to share our knowledge, share our resources, et cetera. Um, so, you know, so the, the questions that I will be addressing in a webinar to come uh, for those that are interested in joining me and answering this question of what do we need to do is thinking about things such as, you know, what does we as a robotics community need to change? And what do we, how do we, need, what do we need to change in terms of what we do? Um, so is there opportunities for increased collaboration um, and is it just collaboration within states or is it more broadly looking at collaboration across different service uh, types of industries um, or is it a more broader remit around how those collaborations work? Um, do we need to change the way we talk about robotics? And I think um, that's in terms of how we talk about them within our field, but also maybe how we talk more, more uh, across more broadly. I think it's clarity in some of the definitions that we use of robotics and having a technology. Um, are we representing the work that we do well? Are we communicating it well to the stakeholders um, and maybe addressing some of those larger political roadblocks that we might be reaching at some stage? Um, I think Sue brought up a very nice example of how, you know, sort of talking about robots in a different frame in terms of looking at robotics as actually job creation. Um, and, and sort of how can we add to that agenda more broadly as well. Um, and I expect this, that speaks to another question that we could be looking at exploring is, you know, how can we change perceptions that are out there about robotics? And if you look at how we are introducing robotics in service sectors, there's a broad range of stakeholders out there. So which ha who have a broad range of perspectives and the roadmap's, roadmap's done very well the broader scale at, at, to that larger, broader agenda of looking at how we can get governments involved. Um, but how can we change or how can we enhance the way that we enhance or change perceptions across all the different stakeholders from the people that are using them in the front lines to people that are making decisions about whether robots should be used in certain service sectors, the broader government support, but then also the people that are interacting with robots um, as, as a customer on the other side of the service that we offer. And then I think, you know, the, the broader sort of question that sits under across all of that is how we actually might be able to work better to position ourselves or organise ourselves, ourselves as a community. Um, so is there ex examples of that have been shown already by Sue, you know, in terms of looking at the Queensland Field Robotics Cluster? Um, I know just in our space, and I know Mary's a part of this as well, we've set up a social robotics network in Australia, which is looking specifically at social robotics. Um, you know, I think everyone's doing their bit to try and work collaboratively, um, but how can we maybe set that up to have, you know, sort of more broader impact and share the knowledge and share the collaborations that we're having. So I think that that's given you enough of an insight perhaps into, you know, some of the some of the questions you're talking about, you know, what can we do as, as in terms of how do we move this forward in the social in the service space. Um, so if you'd like to join for a further for that conversation, please do um, look out for the information that we'll be sending out um, after this session today about the specific webinars that we're having. Please also know that you don't have to join just one webinar. Obviously, if you've got uh, opinions and ideas, please do join all the different types of webinars and give as many opinions and ideas as you possibly can. Um, and I probably want to point you to the uh, survey that Sue's sending out. So question five within that survey directly addresses this particular point that I'm raising. So if you've got some ideas and you want to drop them down straight away to, to sort of start that conversation, please do put them in there because I'll be looking at them and they'll be helping frame what we're going to be talking about in the webinar. So thank you so much for that. I'm now going to hand over to Trevor, I believe, who's going to talk about our third point in terms of what the questions that we're asking or posing today. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Michael. 
Uh, look, uh, my name is Trevor Fitzgibbons. Uh, I've been doing field robotics for quite some time, and I'm going to be leading the, the third webinar, the third question, which is titled 10 things we can do to increase delivery and adoption. Um, in my industry, it's slow. It is very slow. We are very advanced, but very slow. And what we'd like to be doing in this webinar, this workshop, is to start looking at trying to reach that end goal. How can we actually get things adopted? How can we get things delivered faster? Uh, Sue, great presentation, um, touched on a lot of the parts that we need to talk about. Uh, what are the capabilities that we need in five, 10, and 15 years be available to us? Uh, what basically, what are the perceptions of other people with regards to technology? Um, so basically, one of the things that I'd like to start off with um, in this workshop is to start looking at what are the hurdles in your market? Um, have you got a success story where you have had these hurdles and you've gone over it? What type of horizontal thinking have you thought about to actually overcome these? And let's get a list together to actually start looking, putting these together for your different markets in the service areas. The reason why we're taking this approach is because there is not going to be one cookie cutter solution to this. And what we'd like to do is be able to be able to come out of that webinar with a list, a list of 10 things that we can improve on delivery. So uh, just to give you a, a bit of a background on where I work with, basically the, I work in automating field robotics on terminals. We have big straddle carriers running around. We have RMGs going back and forth. We automate the, um, the management between containers. But they're expensive, they're high capital costs. Also, when you buy a straddle, it's 20 years. So instead of thinking about your iPhone where you buy one every year and each one has a new improvement, we're talking about a hardware improvement maybe every 15 years. That's not gonna encourage people to, to buy automation and ports. So what can we do? On the other hand, we've got to look at business approaches. The people who can spend money on high amounts to actually advance into services tend to be older companies. They tend to have different approaches. Uh, some companies use automation to sell other things. Uh, other ones go into automation to improve their business, but don't want to go into selling it. Um, these are things I've actually experienced. So that's my experience. You have your experiences. I want you guys to come to this webinar. I want you guys to, and girls, sorry, I'm being a little bit side on that one. I want you to tell me your stories. I want you to give me examples of hurdles. I want you to give me examples of if you've jumped over them. And let's talk about what we can do to get over that. Let's get a list together. Let's put this together and let's put this into the next roadmap because that's what I'd like to do. And I'm gonna encourage everyone to go to all the webinars because it's one story that we've got to work towards. Things will overlap. One person might think of one thing, I encourage you to do all that. In fact, I encourage you to fill out that survey as soon as you can. And if you're interested in how do I overcome hurdles and what could I contribute to other robotics markets out there, then look at questions seven and nine, fill those out. Sign up for the webinar when we put out the invites and I actually look forward to seeing you there. Um, I hand over to Nikki who will give us a little bit more information on how the rest of this is going to work. Nikki, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Just quickly before you tell everyone the time, I think I'm home. I think Sue wanted to say a couple of words on engineering in Australia. Go for it. Nathan. Um, yeah, so there was a, a, some uh, interesting discussion happening in the chat and I just wanted to pick up on two points. Uh, one, someone asked uh, whether Engineers Australia was involved in the roadmap. Um, we would love for Engineers Australia to be more involved. In the first robotics roadmap, uh, Michael Lucas uh, was our representative uh, from Engineers Australia and he was actually one of the co-chairs on the services sector chapter. 
However, he's since moved to the US to work with Tesla, uh, which is great for Tesla, not so great for us. And with all of these things, I'd encourage everyone to bring their networks into this process because we really are just, uh, the, you know, the, the current people involved, we're, we're all limited by our own networks. We get in touch with as many people as we can. And so we're not deliberately trying to exclude anyone. We would like this to be as inclusive a process as possible. But, you know, it's it's quite possible that we might have missed people. And so please, uh, you know, let anyone uh, who is interested be involved. Um, I'd encourage you to participate. Um, and then there was another question around, you know, how could Sydney start up a robotics cluster? Uh, and I think Andrew Scott might be on the line too. So, I mean, he might want to leap in here. But um, Andrew and I spoke about this for some time. We even did a bit of a, 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 a world, like a global tour of different clusters uh, in both the US and Europe to see if we could find what the secret source was to making these clusters happen. There are some quite famous robotics clusters in different parts of the world, such as Adense in Denmark. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, Andrew just got it up and going. He uh, formed an advisory board gave it a name, um, you know, set it up as an entity, um, you know, worked in with Regional Development Australia so that we could have an operating uh, bank account while we try and sort out all the government governance details, uh, created a website and then just got people signing up and has been running events to encourage, uh, you know, building up that community. So obviously we still have to find the sustainable business model. And as I said, you know, we're still working on some of the governance arrangements, but you don't need all of those things to actually get started. And Sydney's the perfect place for a robotics cluster, you know, building on all of those connections that were first made with the Centre for Autonomous Systems. Um, I think Sydney would be a very logical place for a cluster. Um, Andrew, did you want to quickly add anything? I should say Andrew Scott is the uh, lead for the Queensland Robotics Cluster. I can see Andrew's gone off mute, but uh, not hearing anything. Andrew? It's possible that Andrew's having some connectivity issues, but I mean, you can contact any of um, the co-chairs for this or, or you know, get well, in contact mentioning with that um, Andrew has a past. So you can go and search that and you'll at least get a little bit. He's also generally quite a friendly guy, so I suspect once he works out how to get himself off mute, he'd be happy to talk to you and maybe follow up later. Yes, exactly. Um, and. Also, he hosts a, a beer and robots meeting every week <laughs> on tonight. Beverage, beverages and robots, Elliot. Beverages and robots, that's right. Yeah, beverages, sorry, right. yes. It's just, it's just about just creating a community um, and obviously now it's a virtual community. Thanks, Elliot. All right, so I'll hand over to Nikki now. Okay, hello everyone and uh, thank you very much. Uh, morning in the meeting. Um, this is all about connections and networks and um, I definitely encourage you to please connect with us on LinkedIn with all the coaches um, or either follow us because we'll be sending out a lot of notifications um, from this meeting going forward and also um, two for one sends out very interesting posts so um, if you're not connected to her definitely make her your point of contact. Um, just a bit about myself, I'm Nikki, um, I'm the CEO and owner of Exaptic, a truly presence company based in Melbourne. Um, we were involved in the first rollback and uh, my contribution in, in the services sector here. Just on uh, connecting in Melbourne, I'm based in Melbourne, we've got the Melbourne Robotic Meetup Group. Um, that if you're based in Melbourne or actually anywhere in the world, if you're listening to this webinar, please do connect to it or become a member because I do post things there and um, I have very interesting things that are on a monthly basis. So just uh, as you know, this webinar is being recorded um, and it will be sent to you in the next week to 10 days as quickly as we can sort of get everything together. Last of you would have received a link um, email with uh, a Trello board that's been set up at this stage. It's just got a SWOT analysis, but it will obviously expand. And um, the Survey Monkey. Now, I'm sure you've been bombarded with uh, surveys of the COVID and not even in your inbox all over the place, but we really encourage you to fill in this um, survey. It's probably about 10, 10 12 
it's a, it's a quick survey. Um, so we'd really encourage you to do that. That will be sent out again if you haven't already registered. I think I had five registrations um, sort of after the email went out, so I will get that uh, email to you with the links. Um, as Sue mentioned, this is the virtual workshop, the first of um, going forward with all the workshops that we're going to do. We are hoping, of course, when uh, restrictions have been lifted, that we will get be able to get together and meet you all in person. Um, but I do encourage you to go and look at the Robotics Australia Network website. That's actually up and running. Please do register yourself there and start receiving the newsletter as well when it gets, but do register yourself because all the virtual workshops are actually on the calendar of events there. So going forward, it's an easy place for you to find out where it is. So, um, I'm going to keep it short. Thank you very much for attending this, this virtual meeting. Um, just seeing if there are any other questions here. Nathan, can you pick up anything else that needs to be attended? Um, You've done a smashing job, Nikki. I think um, everyone's probably burnt out because staring at a screen for 45 minutes is pretty hard for most of us. Yeah, I think so. So um, anyway, as I said, um, please, the emails will be coming out. I'll be sending it. I've got everyone's email addresses. Um, Sue and I discussed this. If, if everyone's okay, and I know we've only got 24 participants at this stage, so I will actually uh, pose the question in the email. Um, it's sort of an opt in um, or opt out so that we can send your um, contact details to other people. So if anyone's got any major objection that they don't want their email address being sent out, um, please do do let me know and I'll take you off the distribution list. But you know, as we pointed out, this is really about networking and really understanding what other expertise is out in the market and what are we missing because um, and if we are missing anything, it's not, it's just because, you know, it's falling through the cracks and, and obviously we can't cover off everything. So again, as you mentioned, please involve anyone that you think would be interested or has an interest in robotics. Um, it's actually very important. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone, it's time to go home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot, guys. And Sue, we do have one, um, one person's already um, answered the survey, just letting you know. Oh, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and apologies for, uh, for not getting my uh, audio to work. It's okay, we can see everything now, Andrew's Canada flag, right. everything. There's no hidden, um, hidden uh, option in, um, in uh, WebEx versus Zoom. <laughs> oh, see, that's why I've got the screen behind me. <laughs> <laughs> While you're paying attention, Andrew, there's, there's actually a plan to make an online kind of repository for this workshop we've just had. So if you want to record 30, 30 seconds kind of video of yourself sitting in front of your webcam of what the Queensland Robotics Cluster is, why it's good, why it's helping and how you hope to bring it across the nation, chuck it up on that um, website as well. It's basically a story, the more people hear about it, the better, right? Yeah, no, will do. Can we just add a big thanks to Marion, who's facing the best of all these uh, webinars and meetings that are going. So uh, thanks, Marion. She's more organised than I am. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Uh, just a quick question on the on the schedule of webinars. Is that being um, posted somewhere or shared? No, you go, Nikki. We're waiting for your date, so um, we'll. Oh, I'll, sorry. Yeah, I'll be yes. prompting you in the next week before the webinar goes out. It's all going out in one email, so we don't bombard with. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, 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 I've been, I've been hammered the past two days, so well, hammered we work, but yeah, I'll send an email out today. Okay. okay. Sorry about clarification. That. We were just worried. That it's the other time. No, I'm joking. <laughs> And, and Andrew, as far as the other chapters, the intent is to hold them on the same day that they were scheduled to be face to face, but we probably haven't quite um, decided on the time, whether it's going to be 11 a.m. or whether it'll be a, a different time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Thank you.